Yes. Like I said, Zoom, really Zoom isn't the um, the free for all. It was something makes me feel they were just taking advantage of the pandemic before saying we all needed to upgrade. Maybe we should do like a fundraiser on our uh, YouTubes and we can get people to pay for our Zoom and beer. That'd be lovely. <laughs> well, if you, get dreaming, enough, kid. if you get big enough on your YouTube, you do the, uh, you see YouTubers do this thing where they do like live Friday night and you have like tiers of questions or something. I, but I don't really understand how it works. And I don't think you can do it live remotely from two different places or you must be able to. I don't know. No, but you know what, man? Like, we've never done one of these face to face, so we should probably do one down in the dungeon next month or something, shouldn't oh, we? Yeah. yeah. Well, what was the, we initially, before that half hour ramble across our deep hatred of Bruce Springsteen Everything. all the way to Vince Neil's um, not so bad voice, was um, I put the question to you um, the bands who have fallen from grace the most. Now, we've sort of been in this position before talking about, you know, awful follow up albums or there was Risk Megadeth, but bands who there's a couple of bands who really fucking lost it. Um, I don't know if you want to yeah. go through. You can't really say you couldn't say that Priest or Maiden lost it, could you? Because whatever they lost to a massive degree, they got back, didn't they? Kind of. Like maybe yeah. not in terms of like writing albums like fucking you know, Defenders of the Faith, but, like, their albums are still good, or, you know, the yeah. new made album's good, and, like, they're, 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 they're on top of their game. Like, they're bigger than they've ever been, or as big as they've ever been. Like, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you could say Priest lost it for those two fucking Ripper albums, but they were still good live at the time, and also they came back with that, um, what, what was the fucking album? Um... Resurrect or, uh, Resurrect, or, Resurrect, or in, no, Angel of Retribution, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, you know, and they're still, they've been decent live, mo mainly, you know, for the last 20 years. And you couldn't say that Maiden really lost it, so to speak. I mean, if I if, you, if I was going to say they lost it, of course, it would be the two Blaze albums. But, you know, they, they got a bit um, of You know what, like, I, I don't think, I, let me, we talked about this many times before, but I don't think that the two Blaze albums are any worse than like No Prayer for the Dan or Fear of the Dark. They're all albums that have like one good song on them. You know? Yeah. So uh, massive, massive letdowns after the 80s albums are filled. Yeah, I think No Prayer for the Dying is a pretty fucking awful record to say the least. I mean, it's... it's it was a shitty move. It was a shitty move by Iron Maiden to do that to us, but they did. Yeah. So how's that hash? Or is that a fruit pastille? <laughs> no, I'm more of the Nuri hash, hash of the town. Um, so, go on, uh, we're, we're talking about bands that had gone, like, start, like, I suppose it can't be started off great. It has to be bands that, you know, were, were totally brilliant for a long time. So, like, Skid Row had two fantastic albums and then became shit. You couldn't yeah. say that that's a fall from grace, is it? No, I mean, I... I, the reason that this prompted the discussion was that um, Guts from Death Forever, um, you know, and all the other th things he's done over the years, said, says to me, they have these sidebar questions in Death Forever, um, and they love lists. They love a good list in Death Forever, and I'm a man who loves a list. But So I get asked to contribute to a couple of them every issue. And this one right. was like, um, you know, how did they word it? They worded it slightly different. Let me just find it. It's a, it's the um, the question was which which band has suffered musically the most? Um, which Ooh, I think, yeah, and then I changed that to so you mean I was trying to be a bit more poetic and I said which band has musically fallen from grace more than any other? Now my answer um, was Bathory, but that's not really a band. Um, but my reason for that was because. When I because I was on a bit of a Bathory listening buzz and to go from Twilight of the Gods to Octagon in three or four years, I think represents the most incredible drop off you've ever. But it's such, a short, it's such a short career, though, man. Like, you know, if you talk about like you would probably accept that their albums are good until 1990 and then they got shit for like what, like two or three years and then they broke up. Um, well, no, there was only really just Corthon, but you had Twilight of the Gods is what, 91. And then, um, or yeah. maybe it's 90, no, 91. And then Requiem is 93. 
and it's a terrible yeah, record. We're, but it, we're but, talked but, about it before, yeah. But it's nothing really prepares you for Octagon. This is an absolutely terrible record. And then you've got Destroyer. Okay, Nordland, he, re, he revives it a bit, a back, a bit, you know, he brings it back a little bit. But um, Trial of the Gods to Octagon. But having said that, when I re-examined the question, I was kind of like, yeah, all right. So this is just one person kind of sort of losing it. I mean, we have here in the list um, Danzig, I think. We just well, you know, like the guy that I go to the gym with, as you would imagine, is a huge Danzig guy. Like, you know, he fucking loves Danzig. And like the thing about Danzig is whenever it was classic lineup Danzig, it was brilliant, you know. Yeah. But brilliant. I think it's one of those things that like they, they didn't realize that, like, you know, or like Danzig didn't realize that he like same as Mustaine, he thought that he was the thing that was making it brilliant when it was actually him and the other guys. So like whenever the classic lineup sort of started falling apart in the I guess when was it like nineteen ninety five? Before yeah. we the other album we talked about that horrendous Yeah, Black Eyes Devil. Album. So like before that their music was great. And then after that I think that and which is weird because I don't think that Danzig was ever at any stage influenced by those guys. Whereas no. I think that like with Mistane and Megadeth, he clearly was like, Oh man, Marty is such a great guitar player, like, you know, let's try and up the game, let's try and make it, you know, cool. Whereas I, I think that Danzig was always doing his own thing, but it just sounded way better when he had had the real real crew with him like you know yeah it's, it's very strange it's like it's you you know he was the he was the main song writer in that he was writing most of the riffs and stuff um as i understand it i mean he you know um, oh, I think. yeah i mean most of the rest of the band in danzig don't have sing, song co-writes no i don't know what that really means i mean they were still bashing out together in a rehearsal room it's that thing of going um from a room full of people with energy and, and like electricity together um, or who just click and then going, oh, it's just me. And now I'll just hire other people to randomly fill in for the bits. I think that will replace what is a super tight rhythm section and the killer guitar player. Um, yeah. And he just, and then you change the engineer, then you change the producer because you think you're bigger than the whole sound. And I think that's what happened to Danzig. But Danzig never, he never managed to claw it back. I went back and re-listened to Death Red, Saboth, and Circle of Snakes, and they all sound awful. They're full of un rock and roll guitar playing. It wouldn't have been so hard for him to go to, let's say, let's say Clutch, to the to go to the engineer of Clutch or any band. You know those big American bands, Blackstone <laughs> Cherry. Let's pick pick an American band with a big open drum sound and a big open sound. You, there's tons of them. Black, whether it could even be Blackstone Cherry or something like this, or you know, um, he has the money to and go, hey, man, you're the engineer for the new Danzig album. Do as you're told, but get a killer drum sound and a killer guitar tone. But they all sound like crap. They all sound like they're recorded on my fucking garage band. And that's kind of unforgivable. You can you can have... No, well, I think that, that's, on, that's on purpose, isn't it? Like, that's one of those things that, like, he's purposely... He's purposely doing that to try and, like, you know... Save the fans money. Can, no, well, like, well, yeah, obviously, but, like, the other side of it is like his artistic thing, same as his, him making his bad films, is he's like, it's supposed to sound shit, like, you know, like yeah, you're the, supposed to be annoyed, annoyed by the drum production, and I then that's know. why. Like, but that's a, but is that true though? Because the first three, four Danzig albums have amazing drum sounds. They have amazing. Yeah, but come on, they're they're all anyway. produced by Rick Rubin on a sure. major label. Yeah, okay. Danzig is making albums for himself and taking half the budget. Yeah, yeah, but okay. Let me do. Uh, let me just put. I mean, I'll, I'll put my own. Hey, neck, I'll put my own neck on the block here, right? If you listen to the last Dread Sovereign album and a song like Her Master's Voice, this has a huge, big drum sound. And if he just, you know, somebody had just gone to him, hey man, there's an there's a young lad in in town who could get a killer drum sound. He doesn't need fifty thousand dollars. He just needs three. Um, let someone else just mix the bloody thing and make it sound like a live record. It's not impossible. Like, I don't think he means those albums to sound like shit. I just think he just doesn't understand anymore. He doesn't know. I think I think some, somewhere along the line, people either get, they just stop listening. To him. I don't know. It's I don't think he means Death Red Sabo to sound processed and peaky and horrible compressed guitar sound with no tone. Like, does he really want? I mean, The Misfits has tone. Yeah. But like, Circle of Snakes is fucking, this is, who's listening to that going, no, this is the mix, man. This is the mix. 
So I just think, yeah, I but think like a, this is one of these sort of stories, like Queen Strike or whatever, where you're like talking about music that was like underground music that became extremely popular music and then went back to being underground music, you know, and it suffered from the same thing. And you can yeah. say the same with a whole bunch of bands, like yeah. Nuclear Salt came over, sounds very underground, and then like you know, the later on in their career sounds very commercial, and then later when they had no money again, it sounds underground. So it's like, well, it's no brainer sometimes me and you love the production on that at war album infidel because we're like man it sounds like the 80s but part of that is also because those dudes were like you know recording that on the fly in alex paralysis studio like it yeah, wasn't but, like a 20 dollar production was it no no i agree with that but uh, but i do think for example infidel has a has a strong drum sound i mainly i mainly pointed out that Danzig and um, those first four albums have just brilliant players, brilliant tones, brilliant individual sounds, and it's not impossible to get a good drum sound and a good bass drum sound. But where's the point where a musician like him just stops listening to anybody who's going, dude, that drum, those drums don't sound good. I mean, we can all hear Circular Snake sounds fucking terrible. Like I remember having this argument with Morgan from Marduk, who's like the biggest uh, Danzig fan there is. He has a Danzig tattoo, and it, it came out while I was hanging out with Morgan. And Morgan was just like through gritted teeth. He was like, no, no, he, just, he really wanted to love it. And you're like, dude, come on, listen to this. This is like, you know, it's not working. And I mean, even a, even a bar room, a bar room, $500 drum sound would be better than this stuff. But what's the point where people just, um, you know, you could see where Steve Harris's point was, where he's like, now I'm going to be the producer. We're going to put the studio in my back garden and there's going to be a bar. Um, we're going to go back to play in spit and soda style rock and roll. But like, I don't know. It just a part of me doesn't understand where some of these musicians who who've worked on. With, I, I think you'll find that probably that Steve Harris and Danzig had the same problem that like whenever Danzig, the classic lineup broke up and he was faced with having to do something. Same as whenever, you know, Adrian Smith left or Brucey left. Number one option was always as a multimillionaire to hang about in your class gaff doing yeah. fuck all and doing a bit of work there you know yeah. and that's you know that's that, that was what they did like you know so yeah. i don't think that like, danzig was in like danzig at that stage had made a whole bunch of money and he was yeah. like you know i'm the band i don't need these dudes but and, like i know one of the other bands we we're going to talk about was like megadeth like that and it, it it seems like that's the same buzz where it's like his input is more important and i think early whenever he was like david stain and danzig and a whole bunch of other people like that were hungry young young people. They had a whole bunch to contribute songwriting wise. But I, but you know, I would a lot argue, of brilliant stuff to do. But but I, to become multi millionaires. I, I, you know? I agree, and I mean, we've I've just been watching for the first time in years um, some kind of monster again, which is the perfect example of what happens. But I think Mustaine brought it back. From albums like Risk, if you look at System Has Failed, this is arguably a great rock record, really good, strong Megadeth record. Now, you know, I like United Abominations, Endgame. I like 13. So they're all on a reasonable level. I like the new one. But Danzig hasn't made, well, any, Danzig it, hasn't like, made anything not, worth listening to. Like it, it moves up and down. Like. It does, but there's still, it it's goes like, from, like, it goes from five to seven out of ten. But with Danzig, we're talking about a consistent, like, bargain basement. Like, Danzig hasn't made anything worth listening to in 28 years. Whereas, I mean, I'd still put on United Abominations go and really enjoy Washington is Next and Sleepwalker. I like 13 yeah. and I like Public Enemy number one, whatever. I, I, there are Megadeth songs that are still bangers that I, I listen to regularly. By places yeah, still the, regularly. The, hit, the hit rate is now, like you're talking about early 90s Iron Maiden hit rate where you're like, there's like two or three good songs on the album. Uh, but, 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 yeah, okay. But, that, but compared to Danzig, it doesn't even have I mean, it's literally nothing. There's literally no redeemable features in some of these well, records. you know, I think that people who are in the cult of Danzig would be like, no, there are great albums. But then I suppose there are probably Megadeth fans who'd be like, you know, 13 is a brilliant album. You know, well, I think it's a strong, I think it's a good record. I mean, I don't think it's brilliant, but I think System Has Failed <laughs> is genuinely a brilliant record. I do think that's a brilliant oh, record. I don't know. Like, I, for me, I think that the whole story with them ends really with, like, risk was a disaster you know yeah, yeah. everything everything after that has been trying to claw back and i think that like like i don't know there's some there are some good kind of cryptic writing type songs on world needs a hero 
And um, see, I don't, I don't think that's a good system record at is all. Real, but I think the further they go on, like end game is quite good. But then I think after end game, like a uh, thirteen and super collider, we're not super collider's, very good not, at all. super collider's not great. No, no, but I think we're being unfair probably to Megadeth by placing them down at the same bargain basement level as Danzig. I mean, we're we're talking about who has fallen from grace the worst. I mean, the next on the list is Virgin Steel, and I don't know if you're a Virgin Steel fan. I love Virgin Steel. I love eighties Virgin Steel. I love nineties Virgin Steel. Invictus by Virgin Steel is one of my is actually one of my favorite ever epic metal records i love this Tell record so what, what was what's the handling with those guys like is it one of those things like riot where there was a mark reality like was there one guy a la manila road who was like steering the ship or did they like change you know like some bands yeah. flotsam Jetsam kind of changed hands a couple of times or exciter well, changed always hands been, it's things, always been know? it's always been david device at the, at the heart of it mm-hmm. um and then you've got edward persino on the guitar and they've been sort of together but at the band drifted into this some like they they make these huge double albums the last four or five records and they're all it's just like every musical idea goes into them there's lots of this sort of like um orchestral sort of yeah. piano versions the drum sound is like as if it's like we don't need a drummer we'll just use like garage band for the drums and synthesized guitar sounds and stuff and it's just like then especially the 90s, you know, um, Virgin Steel as well was built again on big sounds and big dynamic sounds. And, uh, you know, it just again, that thing of somebody's gone, you know what, I can we can make this at home. We don't need to go into a studio with an engineer, that yeah. thing. And um, yeah, we, I've been very productive. I've written four songs today and because maybe the two, the, the traditional two or three guys, you need Dave Vincent there to hold Trey Ezekdoth in check or whatever you want. You need Lars Ulrich maybe to hold the ideas of Kirk Hammett together. What you'd also say that is that like at most stages of all all the people you're talking about here, they were all young enough to yeah. um, be intimidated by producers musically because no, none of these people were like Marty Friedman who are coming in chewing gum saying, you don't need to tell me what to do. I know what to do here. Like everyone was under the pressure of being all like, you're out of time, you're off pitch, you know, that kind of thing. So that Maybe. I think whenever people are young like that, like there's there's a whole bunch of that's why the early Morbid Angel albums are good is because they were willing to listen to like you know Terry Date or whoever was making the records. So it wasn't him; it was probably the Morris sound dudes, wasn't it? Yeah, it was but Tom um, Morris. Um, but yeah, like so. So that that's that's my point in this is just that I don't know. I think I think that whenever bands are are willing to listen, it'll be good. And then they, when they're not willing to listen, it won't be good. So there's, a, so there's a coefficient here, right? Which is you could probably work out a mathematical equation, which is age, money, right? They, those two things change your willingness to listen. Also, I think this is important: separation from um, being together with other people in a room, right? So there was a moment where Danzig probably stopped hanging out with his band they stopped rehearsing they stopped writing together and he went i'm bigger than all this i don't need all these people oh, big time, man. like I would, I would imagine by the time danzig too danzig had his own tour bus and then yeah. the rest of the dudes were riding in the other bus like yeah so then you get a band like virgin steel for example let's say or running wild is next on the list and they're a good example as well of what it's obvious that because of the rivalry by running wild is a great record i love running wild as well especially 80s and 90s running wild and then after rivalry it just goes woof off a cliff and the reason for that is obvious that they cease to be a band a people guys yeah. who got in a room totally, together totally. when you can see this with virgin seal as well they cease to be there's the drum kit there's the guitar amps plug in let's jam together it was people who probably go i'm moving upstate with the missus to do this other job or i'm now doing this i'm doing that and the rehearsal that used to be once a week became once a month, then became once every three months, then it becomes no nothing at all. Then it's like, I'll send you some files on oh, the computer. Yeah, yeah. And so these right. bands just become, yeah. basically, yeah. they go from Here's, being- what it Here's what I'd say, the caveat that though, Alan, is that like, it's not necessarily the amount of time that people are willing to spend in the same room together. That has to be the thing. It's the amount of time that people are willing to collectively a week put into the project, like, you know? So like, if everybody in your band said, right, we're at, everybody's going to spend six hours a week working on parts and then bringing parts to the band, like, that's what the Beatles end up having to do because they couldn't get on with each other or the Eagles. You know, they weren't they weren't sitting about saying, right, we're going to make a shit album. 
because you know we're not gonna we're not gonna put the work in. They were putting the man hours in, but, but I, they but weren't I, necessarily but I, putting the man hours in. Well, but I, I I agree and I disagree. I think the I putting putting the man hours in is is what's bad for Virgin Steel because there's so many there's so many songs and so many ideas. There's no quality control. And that's but when the guy who's the guitar player goes, that's a terrible idea in the room together. And he doesn't just get yeah. 12, um, you know, MP3s of like, oh, what the fuck are we going to do here? And that's what I mean. It's basically it's going from having a human but, process like, to a digital thing, process. To what, extent, though, man, like, to what extent are some of like, and I don't mean to fucking say this badly about bands like Jag Panzer or Rat or Anvil, who are great bands, but to what extent were they making albums in the 90s for like themselves rather than like it wasn't as if there were people from a record company telling them that album did really well let's do more of this let's try and do this yeah right they, they, were, were, like, they were over the other side of the argument yeah yeah they were on the, they didn't have anybody telling them this is bad don't make a double album the fact that like albums like inish more or whatever by Ryder yeah, yeah. are great was, yeah that's just because you know mark reality is a great songwriter but, but it's also people but it's... people weren't listening like that album was a waste of fucking time because it's only now that people of our generation and younger generations could get into it. Like yeah, I, yeah. at the time, yeah. like it, it was same as like you know that uh, the exciter stuff in the late nineties that you're yeah. a fan of. I yeah. don't think that people at the time, you know, was it worth their time? Maybe not. Like you know. Yeah, yeah. I think you make a very good point, and I think I think it's a different point to what I'm making, but I think it's a very valid point. I think you're right. Is that bands like Riot? Anvil, Exciter, probably Virgin Seal as well, who thought they were going to make it in rabbit ears in the 80s, realized the 90s had come along, they weren't going to, and the pressure was kind of off. And they felt a bit unshackled. I'm talking about really from the end of the 90s, like into 2000 and on, where it was clear people reached a certain age of these bands we're talking about, the list that you just made, and then they realized they all start to move further and further away. And again, that thing of not being in the room together, but it's definitely, definitely, it's a point like where in the nineties, I guess it was, well, we're going to do this for ourselves now. Um, we're not playing to 500 people anymore, playing to 50. And um, the reality is kicked in and do, do, those bands hit a, a rich kind of like um, vein of form that I think went underneath the radar. You know, you Riot is a good example. Those albums are brilliant. Inish Moore, um, Sons of Society, I think is a great record. Even fucking, um, was the one with the fucking stupid one with the shark on the cover? Or the Nightbreaker. Break? Nightbreaker is a good record, mostly. Um, I mean, all those. Re- I mean, I really like uh, the one that's only released in Japan. Um, uh, with all the fucking. But see, like, I think this is the thing, isn't it? Like, these albums are like for rediscovery. And, um, like, I don't mean a... to find it insulting, but it's like you know the. The albums the doors made after jim morrison died in the 70s but yeah you know, i heard yeah. I, only, I only heard about these recently brethren of the long house that's what it is that's a fucking brilliant record i love it um yeah. i only you are i only read, learned this from you that the doors kind of went but, oh, we, we but, go on without him yeah exactly and like sure many bands have done the same thing like sure red are doing the same thing now and it's good yeah. like now, the doors albums are shit but what I'm saying is that, like, there's there's an infinite amount of people in the future to fucking get turned on to these Virgin Steel albums or, you know, uh, Lords of the Crimson Chaos or, you know, the, like, because they came from that era, didn't they? They were part of that original Fandango of, like, well, fake bands were, and stuff. They, they, yeah, and ex- they did make some fake, fake records. Exorcist, and stuff, Exorcist was yeah. their kind of fake death metal record. And then there was also... Um, I think they were they, they were with the Crimson Alliance and somebody else, wasn't it? Pile Driver. They were they did the second Pile Driver. I think Stay Ugly. That was yeah. Virgin Steel's. Tell you what, here's a pitch shift for you. You know what I was listening to today, man? That I think you might like. Uh, Blood Money. Did you ever listen to those guys? Blood Money. From are they from Bally Money? That would be good. No, Bally Bally Money. Hold on, I'm gonna try. And... I'm going to try and go off my Wi-Fi here and see if it'll improve the signal. Oh, this is dangerous. I'm supposed to talk now while you look um, like you've been frozen in the Arctic tundra for quite a while. You see, this is what happens. The perils of live TV. I know it's desperate, man, isn't it? I feel like uh, I feel like Philip Schofield or something, you know. 
or what's his name who was doing the TV show where the lad crashed his car and died? Noel Edmonds. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, okay. What's going on? We're in the bunker here. Uh, I'm going to show you around. You'll see that we're in the middle of a nuclear bunker in the middle of nowhere here. So, oh, yeah. That's how things are in Uri these days. We have to face up to reality. Yeah, I think, I, well, I, I mean, I think you make a good point. I think, as you, I think there's a whole different bunch of points to be made about why some bands fall off the map. I, I think part of it is probably um, people being separated from each other. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's fame. Sometimes it's people's just unwillingness to go back in the room and rehearse. They think they can just do it at home. Sometimes it's the pressure is off, the pressure's on. Yeah, there's there's loads of reasons. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go down through this list though. Running wild, yeah. I mean, after 1998, again, they all just sound like they're made uh, by on a computer with a drum yeah, machine. Um, and you know, the thing about that as well is, again, the original crew, like the the albums that were brilliant, had extended bass bits, and like everybody in the band clearly had a say. Whereas yeah. the more the rock and Rolf and his wife obviously sort of took over the show, the more yeah. that it was just like, destroyed. Like, you know? yeah. I mean, and and for people who don't know those albums. Um, I mean, I love Branded and Exiled and all the early ones, but Death or Glory is amazing. It's one of the greatest heavy metal records yeah, of all like, time. Like it's up, fucking... up, into, up to the mid '90s, their albums are brilliant. Like, well, yeah. the rivalry is '98, and I would say that's a brilliant record. And um, but I mean, Masquerade is fucking great. Black Hand in Pile of Skulls. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, and there's a band who made like I. I mean, I have about fucking I don't know stupid amount of Running Wild stuff, but everything from the first appearance. On the noise records thing and then you've got you know branded and exiled um what's and for, it? see for me man they're one of those bands that i think honestly in 20 years time or 30 years time whenever no one has listened to fucking bullshit bands like eelstorm loads of people are going to realize what not only forget the pirate theme run wild were actually a brilliant heavy metal band yeah. and probably one of the best from oh. germany like I, you know probably Arguably better than best. Than the <laughs> yeah i would oh easily they're way better than halloween I mean, I would, I would say that Death or Glory, that album from '89, is, I mean, heavy metal records top, top. It's in the top forty of all time for me. Has to be. It's right in the storm and stuff. It's just fucking. It's bangers all the way, and it sounds brilliant. Yep. The playing is brilliant. The tone is brilliant. Great choruses. I mean, I bought that in a. There was a pound shop or like a charity shop. It's not a charity shop. It was called Chapter. So it was a Christian bookstore here in Dublin, and the basement was just just had thousands of vinyls and you could if you look through things you could find they would obviously buy and refused stock from places all around the world and you would get like 10 copies of hall of the mountain king for like a pound and in 1989 1991 92 you could find all sorts of super obscure records like loads of weird things i got for like next to nothing like neat records seven inches from 81 for like 25p but running wild was a band that i just picked up you couldn't buy anything of them in the sound store, so I just picked up like a bunch of vinyls, maybe early nineties for one, two, three quid. Um, uh, black or not under? Yeah, under Jolly Roger. And um, what's the one after that? Port Royal. One, two. Royal, yeah. And they're fucking brilliant. They're just fucking great. Oh, yeah. Totally. Go on. Who's next on your list? Bud? Well, it's Man of War. <laughs> yeah. And here, man, Michelangelo Bato. That's the fucking <laughs> best news I've heard. That's the best news I've heard since fucking Hail to England. Like, this is fucking class. Like, yeah, it's... I think they could, they could make some ridiculously stupid music that I would like to hear. Yeah, I mean, I listened to that, the last one, the, something of the Tales of Odysseus or whatever it's called, the new thing. It has one metal song stuck at the end of all these speeches and shite. And again, it's... It's like, get a drummer. But you know what? I, actually, I'll say this. I will say this um, today... I went with trepidation and listened to the remixes of Interglory Ride and Hail to England. And I have to say, they're fucking brilliant. I, I expected nothing. Uh, the the re Interglory Ride is better than Hail to England, but they sound... So what, what's amazing. the deal? Like, were, were they done by fucking the band or... I, 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 didn't, I didn't look at the details and I, I pressed play and went, oh, fucking here we go. All right. Interglory Ride... Um, and it's like a bigger, bigger bass and way expanded tone. Drums are a, a, 
a bit snappier, a bit heavier. Um, the guitar. Is it, like, are they, a, are they a classic case of their albums come out best in order? Like, as in first albums, the best running through to present day. Like, I, I think that would probably be accurate. Like, I love Sign of the Hammer probably more than Into Glory Ride and Hill oh, England, no, but no. No way. It's still, like, you know, I still think that, like, they're, it's quite sequentially good. Like, because yeah. the first album sounds like such a 70s rock record. Like, you know. Yeah. I mean, I love Sound Hammer, but it does start off with, like, you know, Animals and Old Man Playing Ten are just like Kiss kind of, you know, pop songs. Good. I mean, Animal, though, you know, and stuff. But yeah. it's, and then you're into Thor the Powerhead and stuff. But try on those fucking remix, remaster, whatever the fuck they are, into the Glory Ride. It sounds brilliant. I, I mean, really good compared to the crappy version of the Megadeth ones. But yeah, but the last, I mean, Man of War ran out of gas in the tank after War is the World, which is an okay record. And then after the last, the Lord of Steel and stuff's like, wow, well, again, get some young guy in who loves Man of War to mix your fucking record and let him mix it properly with a proper drum sound. Get a drummer to play. Like, like Stop with Mario. this drum machine shit. Yeah. But like he has Steve Harris disease, you know. But Joey DeMaro's problem is that like he clearly bought some drum samples on like you know Windows ninety eight, and he's still using them. Like you know, he's getting the money he's worth out of them. Like you know. But it's just stop doing at home in your studio. Go into fucking town, call up the listen to a new band, and you go, "Geez, that sounds like a great drum sound." There's tons of them. Go, hey, can you record some real drums? Again, it's Lord of Steel is. It's fucking terrible, um, but you know, they're they. I'll give them the. They are what sixty eight to seventy two years old. So I mean, you know, a run of nineteen eighty one to two thousand and one, where you're pretty, like you're incredible. To yeah, not bad. It's not bad, but the last twenty years have been pretty grim. You know, next on the list is In Flames, but I'm not in really position to comment on that. I don't want to talk about In Flames. <laughs> okay, Sepultura. Okay. But you know, like to be fair, like I th- I really think, man, that the last like one or two albums have made like two or three albums in the two thousands, two thousand and tens that have been very good. Like, you know. ah, very good. Come on, Do, really? I thought, I, I thought Alex and the la- the fucking most recent one were like very thrashy and very in the same vein as like. Like, it, here's the thing. It's the problem with the new Exodus album that it doesn't sound like Bonded by Blood or that me and you are too old to get excited about there being a new Exodus album that sounds well, like, you well, know, raspy. Well, it's both. I mean, I actually went and re-listened to the new Exodus about five times, I'd say. And it grew on me more and more every time. But I realized how the vocals kind of annoyed me. There's too many songs. And I got a bit tired of, like, there being no up and down in the dynamics of the instruments. Because yeah. the drums are just so. Truly, relentless. you would imagine that, like fucking uh, the uh, Messiah, whatever the last aperture was, like you would, you would probably, if you listened to it five times, start really liking it. You know. Really? Because I, I tried to. Well, listen, like, I, I tried I've to listen to them quite a bit, and I thought that they were definitely a, a, a really different thing than like fucking like all that like early two thousand stuff. You know, like the like where they were trying to continue on the root sound they definitely had gone back to trying to make more of a you know like a rise type vibe on the albums look really i just i tried to listen to one with the stupid sort of um clockwork thing on the front what was that called uh what was that it was that not fucking a a a lux or something like that i don't know i don't and then they had some what i'm not not saying i'm fucking a massive fan of these records but i think that like it like they're definitely a lot more i would say like i would compare to them to new creator records like you know it's not necessarily something that i would be massively into like i'm not going to go and fucking get into the songs themselves but i appreciate that they're not making albums like they were in like you know I know the late nineties where it was like not not my vibe at all. Hmm. I mean, on the list here, somebody's written Cataclysm. I don't know anything about that. Um, Kiss. I mean, these are journalists' choice, and I think some of these choices are a bit stupid, to be honest. Well, like, what what is bad Kiss? Like, you know, you're like, is it not fucking quite the samey? Like, because as much as people feel like, oh man, the seventies stuff was great. Like, they've loads of great songs in the eighties. 
Yeah. You know, fucking I love it. let's put the X back in sex. And I, like, you know, uh, that, uh, that year God gave rock and roll to you was a number four hit in Ireland in 1990. What about, what about, what about uh, uh, all night? I mean, who could deny that? No. Well, like, so what, their new albums are not as good as their 70s or their 80s albums or their 90s albums, like Psycho Circus and all that. I would imagine that album is shit. I don't, I think you would need to, you would need to be fucking really into Kiss to listen to those records, wouldn't you? It's like, if you love, if you love Deep Purple loads and loads, you would probably check out their album Icebreaker or whatever. Yeah. I mean, somebody has on the next on the list, Warrior Soul. They're a band I never listened to. Like I think they're one of those bands like in the early nineties, like Mind Funk or whatever, where like people were super into the vibe on the first two albums and like Lars Ulrich massive up Warrior Soul Tons. They opened up Milton Keynes gig in nineteen ninety three, you know, the right. Metallica one or whatever with Megadeth. So they definitely like had a fucking a big role one. But uh like they still they still exist in a way that's kinda of, like more like the myth uh like a you know, the Crow Mags or Ugly Kid Joe, where they can go and play in Galway and, like, you know, Cork, and people will dig it. Look, but will but they? I don't I mean, know. I don't, like, think, I, I don't think anybody's showing up to see, I don't think anybody's really showing up to see Warrior Soul anymore. cro have got a new I'm bit. Not, I'm, definitely not, I'm definitely not going. Like, if there's anything on that night, I, I would rather do whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's kind of like, I mean, there's other, I mean, I had Morbid Angel, also on my list, my short list, and that's basically because of where they went with that fucking, you know, electronic record. Um, I'm sure there's other yeah, bands. Like, you know, they were clearly one of those bands, like, you know, Megadeth and stuff, where it's like, they're, whenever they make these creative faux pas, like, and they've done so, like, you know, like, people like their albums generally up until the late 90s, don't they? Like, but, um, like, yeah. after that, whenever, whenever they were getting into that sort of electronic stuff, after that, they were just trying to make albums that sounded like their 90s albums, you know, so. Yeah, well, I think, well, the last one is kind of, yeah, it's sort of unlistenable, but yeah. But I don't know, there's, there's a, you could, I suppose, realist, from some standpoint, you could argue this about most, but I mean, Paradise Lost kind of fell off a fucking um, a cliff as well when they kind of went totally electronic. But now, in hindsight. Well, like, I have to say, man, I think that Paradise Lost's failures were successes. I yeah, didn't think that. I, there were too many of their albums that were like creatively fucking shit. Like they were no, kind of like. I agree with that. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think for their fans, a lot of people were disappointed. But I think in retrospect, when you listen to Host and um, what's the blue one, I mean, they're still good songs, you know. Um. Yeah. Like I, I don't know. Paradise Lost would definitely be for me a band that right. They did lots of different stuff, and probably a lot of it might have only been of interest of people who lived in the UK and Ireland. You know, like there was a lot of bands like that in the nineties and stuff like that where I know I don't imagine that three colours red were a big deal, like you know, in Europe. Well, well I did I mean I did go and see Paradise Lost a few years ago um in Berlin and the song that got the biggest reaction of the whole night was Say Just Words. So right. uh, in Germany okay. their their piano we got stuff was probably bigger, maybe. I'm not sure, you know. The Germans were like that's a the, the there's a kind of vibe there though like there's a whole bunch of bands like them or like uh Die Krups or Anathema or even fucking Therapy from Northern Ireland like where their sort of their gothy sort of like late nineties early two thousand stuff was fucking very up with the leather trouser Germans or plastic trouser Germans of the early two yeah. thousands like you know so it always bug it always nothing. confused me I never understood the popularity of Therapy ever i remember being even in the early 90s watching them on mtv and they'd be on at donnington after like megadeth or something and it'd be mm. you know going nowhere or something i'm beginning like, is this what what is this that there was this whole kind of sort of slightly slightly punky scuzzy well, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not metal music is it it's like it, it's like a it like it's alternative like sort of punk music but like you know there there are metal songs like the knives and stuff are definitely metal bangers like but again the thing is, it's all to do with what you were doing at the time, because that was, that's like, in 20 years' time, if someone was trying to convince me that the new Creator album was great, while well, I was 40, I'd be like, no, sure you mad, I was listening to fucking, I don't know, Hammer Whore or Tears. Oh. 
<clears throat> a confusing and intricate world of Zoom. Yeah, I, d I don't know. I don't mean to just like totally shit on all those bands all the time, but that whole thing, therapy, curb dog, all this stuff, it just seemed to be like at the time in Ireland, is there no one who's just making heavy metal or like it's all uh, this no. alternative? The answer, the answer, the answer to that is no. <laughs> huh? Isn't it like, you know, the answer to that is no. It was just like, I don't think that, I think your, your problem with all that sort of music is that it has an association with heavy metal. You know, that's not heavy metal music. So, like, but, like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I think it's one of those things that because you lived it and you were there in the early nineties, and that was while you were doing your thing, mm. you're gonna always have like a feeling. I feel the same way. Like, whenever in the early two thousands, new metal like was still very, very, very popular and stuff, and we were doing our proto thrash thing, like you know, yeah. Like that's why atom craft and stuff like that was so important to us. Like you know, because we're like, this is this is what we want to do. Like we want to try and like make noise quickly. <laughs> well, who was the bands from Ireland who were like if therapy was it for me in 1992? Then who were the bands in 2002 who were the objects of derision from um you know from your point of view? Then you know when you were. And, like was that part of the reason why like we fucking got a pretty handy ride into you know going and playing in England like it was a pretty open field like you know you guys were out gigging you know and like to be fair like Morton Beloved and Cruacon and there were some other bands you know out there like fucking Waylander but like there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of other Irish bands out there. No, what I mean is, that we, like we could be all like, oh, I hate those guys. I want to fucking go and do the total opposite of that. Yeah. There was none of that well, locally. The only thing locally that we ever had was that, like there was like bands who sounded like you know, like I like the guys in Sinisense and stuff, but it was always Sinisense was like load era Metallica yeah. Yeah. and like fucking therapy mixed together, and that whole thing was huge. There was a bazillion bands like that, and there still is like. Like Trucker Diablo, who I again I think are a good band, but like that's what the vibe is. It's like therapy and load or reload, you know. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, and that was the thing is um the the whole therapy curb dog thing, uh, sort of. I guess what's what we were I was pushing back against because it seemed so um devoid of um it seemed so egoless. It seemed so. Um, devoid of um, image, aesthetic, evil. Um, and it was just so, I'm just a guy wearing, you know, three quarter length combat shorts, playing my mm. guitar. And I just hated it. I hated everything that, that was about it. It was just, just like, it was just sort of loser music. You know, I don't know. It just, it, I just couldn't, because my head was so full of Master's Hammer and Man of War at the time and Rod in Christ and, I was just like, what? Yeah. what, what? Like, I think that's probably as far as you could imagine. But I would imagine you probably felt the same about other music that you might have liked. You know, like Kate Bush, like, you know, Sensual World or whatever. Like, that's mid-90s, isn't it? Like, you know, there's other like music it. of that nature. Yeah, you, you probably weren't. No music apart from what you were into was speaking to you at that time. Because, And I uh, felt the same. I mean, the, whenever I went to university in Preston and was buying all those like Las Rocket albums for a quid and stuff like that in 2001 or whatever, that's that's all I wanted to listen to. And I, I had no interest in listening to The Gathering by Testament, even though well, it might have been a good record because it was like it wasn't what I was about at that time. Like, yeah, know. I mean, well, I mean, in 1990, let's say 1990 to 1994, um, 89 to 94, certainly I was very interested in things like Dead Can Dance, um, getting into uh, Bauhaus or sort of like um, soundtrack music, maybe a bit in you know, different films, trying to pretend, I guess, a bit like they liked a bit of classical music. Um, basically, if it wasn't going to be something really violent or extreme or brutal, I wanted something really miserable or really goth or kind of gloomy. Um, I just didn't have any time for anything that had even the remotest sense of humor. Or, We've talked about this before because yeah, I said times. people are like, nah, 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 nah. apart from Friday I'm in Love, obviously, at, which came out at the same time. Anyway, yeah. go on, go, go down this list. I want to, I want to poke fun at more established bands who are more popular. Well, was, well I mean, to do the rest of the list, was somebody had written Status Quo, which I thought was a kind of a, a kind of a 
you know, I mean, that's a kind Come of a on, low, low. That, that must be one of the fucking biggest piss takes ever because, like, even people who love Steel's Quo will be like, you know, like the the 70s albums are fucking great, like, you know, yeah. but like after in the army now, like, it, are there are there records that people are saying are undiscovered classics? I, no, doubt that. I think what they're saying is that, like, they fell off a cliff by about 82. I mean, whatever you want is 81, that album. 82 81 and i have that and i listen to that a bunch of times and there's about three or four good songs in it but after that you're talking about margarita time and like in the army now is like the last hurrah of that maybe is what year would that be 85 could you imagine like we should do a deep delve man i keep telling you we need to do a deep delve on like bizarre subjects but i would say that they have two or three christmas songs that didn't even chart like you know one from 88, one from 94, where they're just doing, like, horrendous, awful did, Christmas fucking did, carols. Didn't, didn't they whatever. have, like, a kind of, didn't they have something called, like, called, like the Christmas melody or something like this, like a, or, like, a melody? They did to so do some, yeah. or a medley, sorry, some um, rock and roll medley or something, didn't they? Wasn't that a thing? It sounds too frightening to look up. Well, I'm looking it up now, so... Uh, there was one called, I remember it must have been like 1990 or something. Oh, so the here. oh so, here we go, here we go. Uh, it's called, it's called. Uh, the Anniversary Waltz, parts one and two. There you go. And that's the night. Lays from Carnation Street would be affronted. Um, it's um, Sales Go's Anniversary was long version over 10 minutes playing time. Released the CD single special edition. One of their very best. Over ten, over, are you telling me it's even over 10 minutes of quality music? Like, wow. Holy it's shit. 10 minutes, 39 seconds. So fucking have that. Eat the rich. Amazing. That's great. I'm going to get that. Down at Woolworths. I'm going to go down to Woolworths like a man in the 80s video and pick up me single. Go on. So a band that must be on the list, this list, I'm using my Swami powers here, is um, Motorhead. Like, we love Motorhead so fucking much. But, like, let's talk about fucking the off-the-cliffness of Motorhead. Like, what, like th is it a slow decline, do you think? Like, do you like Snake Bite Love or the Sacrifice album or... Um, is it just I, fucking straight, straight from know, the 80s? I did the uh, Motorhead kind of like, um, you know, the kind of career thing with Addy from Solstafir. And right. um, w I think we were too easy because we love Motorhead so much and we kind of love the, well, love Lemmy and the whole, the whole legacy and everything like this. You're kind of loath to really crack down properly hard on yeah. some of those bad records. Like once you hit, you hit March or Die, Bastards, and Death or Glory. And those are like the kind of the last ones before you go boom. And you've got another. Is it uh, March or Die? Isn't it? Yeah, it's not bad. And then you get into the kind of like mid 90s to late 2000s. And it's like they're all right with the best will in the world. I, I went back and listened to every single fucking one of them. And with the best will in the world, um, it's not it's sacrifice and stuff um not, it's not sacrifice that's bad it's what um, about the, like because obviously like um there are there is stuff you know from after the 2000s like you know hammered and killers or whatever that like people who are big fans of the band love those records like and killers is pretty good but I don't know. hang on Mike. it does it seems like a stretch doesn't it it's because people love what Motorhead became and what they stood for and all that kind of thing. We said it in the kind of in the Motorhead video, which was just there was so much goodwill extended to them as they became sort of like cultural icons that realistically people I don't think were critically listening to, um, you know, what they were doing. I mean, oh, man, like this is the shit, shit thing about it. It's I'm like as much as like people might like killers are hammered. No, no, These records not, did not, no, they did no, not matter. Like people were not like fucking outside of the motorhead world were not taking notice those records. No, I, I mean, think. okay, there's no hang on, just to clear it up, there's no killers. The the album I'm talking about that's um I mean we've got 
from we've got bastards sacrifice sacrifice overnight sensation snake bite love we are motorhead hammered inferno kiss of death motorizer the world is yours aftershock and really from about snake bite love onwards especially this inferno is not a good record especially this kiss of death motorizer world is yours this triumph no, record. Yeah, the, uh, I, think, I would say that the later, later stuff is not good, but uh, I think uh, Inferno uh, and Hammered, they're the two ones that came in a row, weren't they? Yeah, like, 2002, um, 2004. In the early 2000s. When Hammered is... 2002. We Are Motorhead hmm? is two, 2002. We Are Motorhead is 2000. But Snake Bite Love is also not great. Overnight Sensation is not bad. Sacrifice is the title track kind of overlooks it. But no. there's there's some... The problem with what happened with Motorhead is they just settled into what I what seems to me to, it comes back to some of the things points you made earlier, which was they live far apart. They don't rehearse uh, until they come to write a record and they get together in the studio and they record and rehearse at the same time. And every song makes it onto the record. They're tuned, they're tuned down and every single record has the same sound. And also whatever happened to Phil Campbell? This dun, 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 it's like his playing he lost all the rock and roll and the swagger from his playing there's no twin harmonies there's no the, like the I think that's is, probably more lemmy though like that's at lemmy's direction lemmy send him listen phil i want your guitars to sound more modern we're going to keep the drums and bass and lemminess but i would like you to have that more down tune well i think that's all, i think that's to do with his voice as well he he was losing his voice over the years and they kept tuning down to combinate his singing, mm -hmm. which doesn't, you know, but it, it, Motorhead come early 2000s, it's too heavy. Like it's not rock and roll anymore. It's like, let me says we're not heavy metal or rock and roll, but actually those albums, especially in the early to mid 2000s, they're heavy metal records. Well, and yeah, but they, they did get a wee bit, I think there was a bit more rock and roll going on. Like, you know, whenever they were trying to do stuff like whorehouse blues and all that, but it's not like, you know, going to Brazil, like that is a class rock and roll song. Yeah, but, like, but, see, the, but, see, the, but going to Brazil is from um, 1916. And 1916 is still a great record. I think 1916, March of Die and Bastards. Bastards, okay, you're still beginning to see a change. But March of Die is still a good record. And they still has a huge sound and tone and big drum sound. But by the time you get to Snake Bite Love, We Are Motor Out Hammer and Infer I mean, I'm not saying they're bad. Kiss of Death, Motorizer, uh, it's too... It's all got the same tone, same guitar sound, same studio, same kind of vibe. Um, there's not many songs that are like raucous rock and roll stuff. It's all... And there should be no gong, 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 gong in Motorhead, in my opinion. It shouldn't be chunk, 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 chunk. It shouldn't be fucking pan muted. That's not what rock and Motorhead is. It's, it's fucking, it's got to be way more reckless and wild playing. And Phil, but Phil played on like Orgasmatron and he played on great records from the 80s, played on rock and roll, which I think is an underrated classic, Stone Deaf in the USA. That comes oh, I, I, I would nearly say that like rock and roll, Another Perfect Day and Ace of Spades probably be my favorite records. Mm, Another Perfect Day is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's 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 totally yeah. underrated record. I would say like rock and roll is not very far off it. Like you know, there's many many fantastic songs in the Stone Deaf in the USA, Eat the Rich. Like, but the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you got the bar. There's a lot of really great tunes. Yeah, yeah, record. yeah. The, I agree with you, the Wolf and stuff. But I mean, um, if you take a song like Stone Deaf in the USA with that shuffle boogie, there isn't a single yeah. song like that in the late nineties, two thousands. Just a dun, 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 like that shuffle boogie yeah. style. It's all it's like what we said, like going to, Brazil, going to Brazil is the same vibe as that. Yeah, like, you know, totally. But that stuff but, just moved off the radar. It, it's yeah, but like, you know, they become a band like the Ramones, like where like it's a t shirt and like you know, it's a mm. gig and it's not necessarily about an album. No, no. I would accept that. Company. I would accept that. And they, they got a whole bunch of kudos around then, though, man. You have to remember that they were nominated for Grammys and a whole bunch yeah. of other ballots. Yeah, yeah. In the early, early 90s, like they, they became an, an institution of yeah, yeah. West Coast American heavy metal. Like, and I, I accept that. And I think it's, um, I think it feels sacrilegious to criticize those records. But I, I, I would ask anyone to, in, 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 let's say, training for that um, thing, the, the, the talk I did or the discussion I did with Addy from Salt Sphere, 
I fucking listened to every every single Mohead record in a row. And I listened to... That, 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 that is fucking commendable. You should get a special medal. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, of course, I don't really need to listen to Iron Fist, Race of Spades. But I, did, I started around... Well, I started around like... I listened... I, of course, we went through bits and pieces of them, all the ones I know, like the back of my hand. But starting in about 1989... You can see in 1989, Lemmy obviously moves to LA and that's when things change a bit. But those first three records are for, you know, still for big labels and they're different labels and they still have some rock and roll swagger and a big open sound and they're not tuned down yet. And then I, I just think they became too familiar with the engineer. Make it in LA, come over, every riff ends up being a song. Um, you know, I almost think, I feel like they're too heavy. They're too heavy metal and they aren't, um, because if you listen to old Motorhead, you listen to the playing of, you know, in Bomber or in Overkill or something, It's it's got subtleties to it that those records yeah, don't, see, have, the don't is, have we're anymore. Going back to, you know, the, the difference is the, the, the gang, as we were talking about with like Danzig, like whenever you have the gang, the original four guys there, whenever you have the original, and, well, it doesn't even have to be four guys, like whenever Brian Robinson was in, it was great, but I'm not necessarily saying like Mickey D and Phil are, are a good lineup of yeah, yeah. Motorhead, it's great. but I, I, honestly, I honestly don't think that maybe by then Lemmy was just hanging about, loving the rainbow and just living it up, which fair bled him for doing it. But like I, maybe they just didn't have songwriting chops to bring to the table, and yeah. they were just arriving there to be dudes. Yeah. Whereas it, it felt like that, like the thing with Brian Robinson and uh, um, Fast Eddie and Filthy Animal was that they were incredibly opinionated people, all of them, like, you know, massively opinionated. And that's why they all left Motorhead or got thrown out or whatever. Yeah. But that, that those opinions, as you know, being a primordial is <laughs> like, that's why it takes you five or six years for you guys to make an album is because everybody has a very, very like massive opinion that they want to err, you know, and that yeah. happens all the time in bands where they're making like, good music. That's that that was why mu Motorhead's music was brilliant. Whenever everyone was giving a fuck, and then whenever it was like, let's just like do whatever. But it's also, it's but it's also, I think, I think you're right. But I also think that if you're given, if you're afforded the ability, afforded the opportunity to be a professional musician, such as Motorhead were, where you don't have to work a normal job and then come to the table with arguments like motorhead were all they're touring 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 you know they're it's not like phil campbell is going back to work in the auto parts shop after the after the tour or whatever they're making enough to survive i imagine but it's just coming over like okay the new album is scheduled for here we book six weeks in the studio and we just jam every day and whatever comes out but that's i mean sometimes it works for bands um and i'm not saying those motor albums, albums are bad there's just too bloody many of them there's about eight there in in a really short succession, bang, 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 bang. And I could go through them and pick out a good double album, maybe, or a, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, you know, the you thing you would say about Motorhead is like, they were in that sort of phase, like Queen Shrike, where they're just like, you know what? There's 52 or 50 fucking one states in the United States of America and each one of those has like about 30 casinos and we could play every one of them like you know yeah yeah no I mean I'd say um, I mean you know the the album was a facility to tour and get back on the road and do what they wanted to do and that's fine but I don't think they well, uh, who's next on the list though because like I feel like you've motorheaded it up with a uh, himself bigger that's true. There isn't really anybody else on this particular list, so you'd have to think of some out of your brain box, which is problematic, isn't it? Yeah, like, I don't know, like, greatest I mean, musical letdown, like, is, is Sabbath musical letdown? I don't think so, because no. the, the, really, the, like the, the letdown was really the late 70s Aussie albums, and then yeah. the letdown would have been probably, I don't know, the early 90s albums, and then after, I don't know, it's hard to say because I'd say that I'd say that people who were really tuned into what Sabbath were realized that they were burnt out by technical ecstasy and never say die, reignited with Dio. But by, by the time you've got 83, 84, 85 comes along, I think they've hemorrhaged millions and millions of fans. I mean, I don't think fans of uh, Volume Four are 
1985 uh, wondering what Eternal Idol is going to be like. I, I, not to a great percentage, you know what I mean? But those albums are, like, are, are uh, great you, records. You, the support band for uh, Eternal Idol, I think it was Wasp doing Inside the Electric Circus and Anthrax doing Spreading the Disease. Mm. I think, is that 85, isn't it? Um, it, it probably would be. There's Eternal Idol, Tear and Headless Cross, so they're all around the same. That's the three triumvirate. You know? But Forbidden is 1990, I guess, and that's a, yeah. I don't know whether you'd say the same thing about Sabbath, though. Well, I think the thing is, like, at least people are interested in Sabbath all through the 70s, all through the 80s and into the 90s. Like Deep Purple, would you, what would you say the interest rate is with purple? People love 60s purple, 70s purple in what, up to Perfect Strangers? Or do you think there are a lot of people who like their Joel and Turner records? Uh, or? Well, hang on. What's the time? Well, what's the timeline in these things? Because I, I have, I mean, Impossible to Cure... And those kind of, you've got the early 80s um, Graham Bonnet Rainbow. Then you've got the Joel and Turner. Well, where is Perfect Strangers? 83, 84, right? No, sorry. I'm a Perfect Strangers, sorry. This is how drunk we are, people of the internet. Perfect Strangers is by uh, Deep Purple, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you're talking about Rainbow. Yeah, sorry. Of course. So Deep Purple is a Perfect Strangers, which is what, 83, 84? Yeah, what the fuck am I talking about? I got it mixed up. But what what album what album is before Perfect Strangers by Deep Purple? I think uh, Perfect I Strangers is it not the a the come uh, come taste the band? Well, there's a tiny bone. That's nineteen nineteen seventy three or seventy four. I'm gonna. Well, what, what's the last uh, like? I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the Tommy Bolin era to tell you what was the last one that he did, but when, I think it was about 1974 or 73. I will tell you is right it? now if my if my uh, computer wouldn't stop having a conniption uh, fit, as the man says. Well, it's getting it's getting old and cranky, a bit like myself I'm trying to get it to. Me too. I'm right. getting old and cranky myself, man. Oh Days yeah, are getting. Well, this is it. Now that you're um, 40 and you have a... Are you going to grow that into a novelty beard, like a Kerry King kind of style? And put like, you know, maybe dye, yes, it, in the, dye it in the green, white and gold or something? Or Drink, uh, Drinking tea on stage, like, it was just such an affront of Slayer fans. Like, the fact that you're watching a Slayer gig and then Tom Ray on top of his, like, you know, bass cabs has got, like, little tea-making stuff. You know, is that, for is that what that was? Thing. Yeah, and it was like it's the total opposite of going on about fucking dead people and liking dead fucks and all that sort of stuff. Like but he's what, literally having a cup of tea, like and making himself a special cup of tea. Like. Is it a special cup of tea? How does one? How is that defined? Well, he was getting a tea bag out. And then dipping it into hot water and then drinking it and then saying just spaced out jointy type chat, which well, I've been saying, you know, I'm a well, master of that myself. Well, I wasn't, um, I mean, to be honest with you, I wasn't close enough to see that he was making tea. There you go. We, were on the bal- we were on the balcony, so we were overlooking the stage. So, like, he was turning around back to his base cabs and on top of the base cabs there were like you know four by tens or whatever he had a what looked like some sort of chinese or like you know maybe possibly vietnamese tea making apparatus like you know okay so check this out come taste the band is 1975 and then there's no album until perfect strangers in 1984 so there you go so 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 you weren't we weren't actually wrong between there was that was the last album with Tommy Bowl in seventy five, and then up to eighty four. So I and which apparently, I mean I'm not a big Deep Purple fan, but Perfect Strangers is not a bad record as I remember. Then House of Blue Light eighty seven. I have no idea about any of the last albums. What I hate about modern Deep Purple, I want to hate is I don't like the puns as as albums. They've an album called Bananas. Now what? Question mark. Ooh, ooh. A whoosh. Fuck off with this shit. This is uh, drives me mad, not mad, but I don't like puns. Anyway, so um, but 
you've got nine years with no record there, so yeah, you weren't wrong. Yeah, well, you know. Would you call it so out? I know people. Whoosh. 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 Oh, yeah. I'll, they do have an album called Whoosh, so. I don't know, but like fucking. They, they, they're wearing cheesecloth shirts, you know? They're not worrying about what me and you and the youth of today <laughs> think of their music. Like, they're like, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you, talk. <laughs> I will say I will say this that the la- they, the the lead single from their last album um, was not bad although you can tell Gillen can't really sing anymore and it's very 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 treated but whatever the song was it has a very cool video and it was not a bad kind of epic organy driven song not bad I mean I still find the voice well Don Harry he does all their or- organ work these days doesn't he like you know yeah and like that's that's one of the things isn't it like Don Harry what are the would have been one of those guys that, like, in any other circumstance, would have been in Gary Moore or uh, Rainbow right now. Like, you know, but, like, you know, Deep Purple is the ultimate, like, fucking stead- steady gig. Like, you were, would you want to be in Richie Blackmore's Rainbow or fucking, well, I suppose Gary Moore's dead, so. Well, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow has Jens Johansson in it, doesn't it? He's, like, the only old guard, old dude who used to be in Yngwie's band. I mean, he's in Richie Blackmore's whatever that is now, mm. along with a bunch of kids who look like they're from Teen Idol, you know? Like our drummer, our old drummer, Paul, who, you know, uh, is a massive, massive Rainbow fan and loves all that e- ALP sort of stuff or whatever. But he, like, he saw no different. He was like, oh, man, fucking Rainbow were totally class. It was amazing. And I was like, how could it be amazing? It was like really old Richie Blackmore and just like Blackmore's night and here they are like plodding through tunes like you know I mean I would give uh, the problem is I give it to the singer that he could sing very well and they said yeah it was cool to watch and for like if you're Richie Blackmore your opinion is listen I've done this six times already I've already sacked six or seven or eight bands worth here's just my new band the problem is that in your head, you associate Rainbow with rock stars who have rock star gravitas, i.e. Yep. they have some aching, you know, they have a huge personality, whether it's Graham Bonnet with his different, uh, you know, kind of slightly odd um, image, or you've got obviously Dio, you've got, we don't need to list all the right. singers of Rainbow off, but then you've got this guy now who's a very good singer, but he just looks like he stepped off, um, you know, like a hot topic, um, you know, American Idol and um, performance, and he has no rock star quality, you know. Well, that, 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 that is not the problem, you know. Like, like that is definitely not the problem, What's the in problem? my opinion. What are the problems like? The the problem is that like here's uh, just a load of fucking decades from I don't know, whatever band. Like, right, fair enough. If the keyboard player has been Malmsteen and done stuff, maybe he was in Rainbow in the late. Or maybe a couple of them more, but like no. you need you need to have they should be trying to get the best pedigree of people they possibly could. If I was them, I'd be like, let's ask Roger Taylor or someone to play a couple of songs, or let's try and get fucking someone like of or like Brian Downey into the band. Like let's well, try and make well, Rainbow better. Well, like could well, you imagine if Rainbow was like Brian Downey, Rudy Sarzo, you know, fucking uh I know Don Airy, like it's it's hard to think. That's a weird thing about nowadays, man. It's hard, hard to think of keyboard players like back in the day in the seventies and eighties. There were loads of people, even like the guy in Bon Jovi, or like there were individual keyboard heroes, like your man Journey or whatever. Like I wouldn't complain about like, Jan- I think Jens Johansson is a fair enough choice, but I totally accept your point. But yeah. I think that's probably from Richie Blackmore's point of view. He's like, well, fuck you. I've done this, like I said already eight times already. I'll have a new band. And so what if they're 25 and you don't know who they are? Uh, what do you want? Uh, but I totally agree with you in the sense that if you're an old Rainbow fan, you go to the gig and you go, OK, I don't recognize or identify with anyone on the stage. Oh, but there's Richie Blackmore. Um, you know, and you're and like, that, and that, that is the crux, man. You're 100 percent right about that, that people at the end of the day are always just going to say, dude, I paid the money to see him playing the Stargates or Solo or whatever, yeah. like, you know, so. But, that's but it. Like, so but there, is, that's a section, cool. but there it. is there is a section of the fans who would be like, "Oh, it's Jorn Lander singing," or it's it's you know it's Jeff Scott Soto, or it's a name, 
not just some 25 year old especially when you're when you're older you're just like all right okay some some kid who's just stepped off the production line and you know no that's what i was trying to use your problem your problem is more who's the singer and like for me it's like rainbow have had many many singers whereas like true yeah i I think that they need to have a better like band like they need to have like fucking. but all the people you're talking about are probably like 65 already you know I guarantee if they asked fucking uh, Billy Sheen to play bass and like fucking anybody to play drums, like fucking, yeah. they, could, they could get an amazing band together. Yeah. Although anybody from after the 70s onwards loves Rainbow so much that they would be totally on for doing that. Like, you know? Yeah, you're probably but right, like, but like, I, 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 I guess it's a, like... He wants to skimp on it. Like he wants to do a fucking just here's me and. and people from Blackmore's Night or whatever the fuck, like, you know? Yeah, no, you're probably right. He doesn't want to spend the money and he wants to, um, I mean, you, you, you are, I mean, I, I just, uh, all the people that you're talking about are probably want <clears throat> to be paid properly. And they're all probably between 55 and 70. Um, and he's probably thinking, you know what? We need new young, um, cogs in the machine, you know, new young yeah. dudes playing and I, I get it, but it's just, you, it's just, you know, it does look and feel weird because you know you pay your money, you want some rock star quality. Dude, here's here's the fucking stupid fucked up thing about this. I'm complaining and slagging off Rainbow for all the things that I was comp- complimenting a uh, foreigner on when I saw them supporting White Snake. Oh, yeah, I fucking yeah. love Foreigner. It was such an amazing gig, but it was like Jeff Pilson and like you know some new dude, and that was it. Like, there was no one from original Foreigner there at all, you know? What, what about your man, um, the lad with the spiky grey hair? What's his name? Mick something or other? Mick Jones? No, he was not there. What, really? Yep. He's the guy. How can you not have him as the, in there? Well, he, he was fucking sick or whatever the fuck, but... Anyway, it was just one of those things that, like, as I said, like, that's me yapping my head off about uh, Rainbow being all like, where's all my friends? And then I still had an amazing time seeing it. And that's it. Like, you know, people do not, like, people who are going to see Rainbow are not like me and you. They don't give a fuck who's in Rainbow. They're just like, I went to see Rainbow and it was killer. Yeah. Uh, But also, also, let's be honest. I mean, Rainbow really is just Richie Blackmore, isn't it? I mean, and if anyone's entitled to just have a complete lineup of random people, it's probably him, I guess, isn't it? You know, like to some extent, you know, there's there's the same thing with like any of those dudes. No, nobody is infallible, you know. So his music got shitter the more that he didn't have people like Ronnie Dio or Jimmy Bean or like you know. Like I really kill our band around him. Like and what is the last Rainbow album then? I mean, it's got to be one of those. Oh, they they go into the nineties. So like after like difficult to cure and stuff. There's like there are like three or four other eighties ones, and I think there might be three or four in the nineties as well. But no, let me. Well, let us know, uh, comments, people. Oh, and no, I'm doing. I'm doing it now. I'm searching this. I need to know this. Um, okay, well, here, I'm going to bet you two pints of delicious pints of Guinness that the last Rainbow uh, studio album is like 1997 or 98. Okay, Rainbow rock band in brackets. Um, let's see, discography. They, do rock. they rock a lot. Okay, right. You've got Down to Earth, 1979, Difficult to Cure, 81, Straight Between the Eyes, which is a, it's not a bad record. Bent Out of Shape, 83, and then Stranger in Us All, 95, which I've never even fucking heard of. 95? Wow, so 95. And I guess that, that must be like a Jeff Scott pseudo record or Joe Lynn. Like, no, not Joe Lynn. It'll have to be like some random fucking Johnny, Johnny Hadouken record. Look. Right, let me tell you this now. Um, fucking. Okay, so... Wow. I've been right. drinking and smoking a lot. <laughs> okay, so blah, 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 blah. Um, jealous lover can't happen here. Straight between the eyes. Difficult to cure. Wow. Stone Cold was a ballad that had some chart success. Number one on Billboard's magazine's rock charts chart. Blah, 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 blah. 1993. 
1988, after joining the band Impelitary, Impelitary, Graham Bonnet covered Since You've Been Gone. No, this is not what I'm looking for at all. Um, no, that's uh, pronunciation, people of the internet. Oh, hang on, hang on. 1993, Blackmore left Deep Purple permanently um, and reformed Rainbow with all new members featuring Scottish singer Doogie White. The band Doogie Rainbow. White? Yes. Yeah. Um, fucking, yeah, yeah, I know that they made a Doogie White record. Doogie White is actually really class. So he is. He's a great singer, yeah. Um, he could have been in the new Rainbow. There you go. Anyway, so um, final concert in Denmark in 1997, and then you get Blackmore's Night. Um, well, yeah, there you go. Stranger and so I've never even heard this record, so I've no idea what it's like. There you go. But Doogie White, yeah. I mean, realistically, he should have been the singer in Maiden, shouldn't he? If you hear his demos of um, Maiden, but you know, he probably wasn't very good at football. I suppose. See, see, this is the thing, isn't it? Like you know, and again, we'll keep hopping about here, but like with with Maiden, like after uh, Seven Sun, they should have went for some sort of fucking brilliantly acoustic, you know, fucking. Here's Fairport Convention meets, like, you know, fucking free Gary Moore. Like, you know, they should have made something like that, you know, that would have suited that sort of vibe, like, you know. And but they could I have. Think they, there was a they way went, they, could... they went totally, totally the wrong. They were, like, making bar rock music, but, like, in a really, really shit way. Like, those albums, yeah. uh, songs like Mother Russia and, like, you know, did they make a song called Run Silent, Run Deep as well? Or was that yeah. Raven? That's true. No, run side and run deep. Yeah, I mean there was a you know, they... like totally like songs that you have like nowhere in your muscle memory of your brain. Do you know what the chorus of that song goes like? Oh, public you enema. Like... Public enema number one is the lowest point. Dude, well, I don't man. I don't actually don't think right. It is shit, but there are a couple of songs on that that are okay. But like, do you think the fear of the dark is massively better? Like, fear of the dark is a brilliant, brilliant song, right? Yeah. But like you know, it's not that much better, no. No, it's not. Like there's like two or three good songs in each of those albums, and they're both total disgraces to Iron Maiden. And it was all just <laughs> them, them saying, "Steve Harris, you do whatever you want," because I'm Dave Murray, and I've got like unbelievable cowboy boots and like blue denim jeans and a belt on and like cow- cowboy tie and black shirt. He was a man for a neckerchief, all right, wasn't he? But you're right. There was another. There was another way they could have gone, just like Slayer could have followed "Spill the Blood" and "South of Heaven" out of the out of the gate, or "Seasons in the Abyss" style, and not gone into this angry divine intervention style. That would have been way more interesting. There was another way Iron Maiden could have gone, which was a bit darker, a bit more proggy, a bit more um, acoustic here and there. Um, you know, following the Seventh Son at side two out the gate. There was another one they could have done. But instead, they went and made Public Enemy number one. So, you know. Yep. And here's the thing is, like, as artists ourselves, we have no idea if we've made our Public Enemy number one or (laughs) are yet to make our Public Enemy number one. Like, you know. (laughs) Only you can tell. (laughs) Well, that's that's the point. And, I mean, we have to make a new album now. So maybe that's what we'll go for. We'll just go for, like, just barroom rock. And lots of puns, like, you know, like whoosh and smush and whatever that stuff is, you know. Um, Our uh, producer, Scott, back in the day, wanted to have a band called Volcano. And the idea of the band was that they were all going to wear exact, like, Brian Johnson outfits, like, you know, and just try and behave as Brian Johnson-y as possible. Even if if you're just the bass? Even if you're just the bass player or the drummer. Your mission was to try and go on like Brian Johnson as much as possible, like you know. And I think that that band could have fucking really, really succeeded, like you know. In in, in which year was this? Yeah, uh, like two thousand and three or four. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure about that. Really? Yeah. Got it. Dun, dun, dun. What is this? It is really bad hash. Nuri hash. It looked green. It's like really old, old fashioned hash that you would have got back in the eighties that wouldn't get you stoned. But you know, what like do you mean? A cigarette, a cigarette. Pie. It looks a bit like a fruit pastel. It's not that good. <laughs> but we're talking, we're talking about um, 
how much support some people get from uh, like you know Garth Brooks rules into town. Mm. Like no worries. And also the thing is every facet of the media and our society comes to lend a hand, you know. Now I'm not suggesting that it's gonna be a similar thing if Iron Maiden or Metallica want to do five nights in Coke Park, but I guarantee they will get much less, you know. Well, I mean Garth Brooks is some other thing. I mean, I, I read that he has sold more albums per head of capita in Ireland than any other country in the world. And I mean, 420,000 people over five days. This yeah. is fucking insane. And um, Springsteen did something similar, like about 10 years ago, he did like a the river tour and yeah. like he played like 80,000 people a couple of nights in Croke Park and then the same in Galway and Cork and Belfast and Derry, you know, so don't underestimate, you know, the two characters we're talking about, like either clutch guy in his shorts or like like redneck guy in his check shirt with ginger hair. Who, like he was at Slane to see Metallica and Guns N' Roses look, you know. But he was also probably at Garth Brooks because for the crack, for the crack. Um, yeah, it's, yep. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I find, I hate Springsteen. I cannot stand it. This sort of. My own. Would you rather listen to Springsteen or Garth Brooks? Garth Brooks, I think, actually. Um, I, I mean, at least... Take note, listeners. Take note of that, listeners. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, there's something more... Uh, there's something There's something that would morbidly fascinate me about Garth Brooks. Uh, um, do you know what I mean? In, 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 in a kind of sort of... Um, like, I'd like to watch an operation on myself sort of thing. Whereas Springsteen just makes me want to vomit. It's so this myopic, sentimental muck. I fucking I cannot stand. Well, see, it. that's what that's what I was trying to say. Is I think that, that like you you know what Springsteen songs are about, and you're like, Ugh, yeah. this upsets me greatly. This emotional <laughs> content. Whereas yeah. you know, like Garth Brooks, I mean you have no idea what his songs are about, but like whatever emotion it is is not of any interest. It's more just you know, like look at the people go, look at the ants build their empire. Yeah, it's and you know, like he, he could have probably um, and attempted some sort of insurrection on the government. I mean, he had, do you know what I mean? Like if he, if he, I mean, there was more when he when his first gigs got cancelled a few years ago, there was more upheaval, social upheaval and unrest almost in the city than there was about people being locked in their houses for over two fucking years. It was like, it was a, a kind of like he could become some sort of. More. Yeah, you could. If you look at it like look at it this way, like there were maybe four hundred thousand upset Garth Brooks fans that his gigs got cancelled, whereas yeah. there were probably less than four hundred thousand people who were upset about having to sit in the house and watch all of Game of Thrones. Like you know, that sounds okay, you know. Yeah, so maybe, bad. maybe. I uh, it's it's just I don't know. It's um, it's a mind boggling um thing when you consider like. Over what, like eight percent of the population went to see Garth Brooks. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, mean I remember somebody somebody said the same thing about Springsteen. They were like, "It's insane that these sort of artists are so popular in Ireland that, that like, you know, like that's probably more of a vote than like twice as much as the Green Party get, right? Like, you know. I mean, the thing, the thing that the difference, the reason why I hate Springsteen so much is he kind of is the sort of, oh, it's brilliant, he played for three hours, really, is it? But it's the kind of, as I said, over-sentimental, over-sincerity of the whole thing, um, apart from the sound, which I despise as well. But, I mean, Garth Brooks is so alien and another planet. Like I said, going to the gig would just be like, what the fuck? Like, it'd be almost like some sort of social experiment, just trying to watch from the outside, what the fuck is going on? Whereas there are people I know who you know, who I like and maybe respect some of their other opinions who like Bruce Springsteen. And I'm just like, what, where's, what's the blind spot here? You know, yeah, but this is, this goes back to the old fashioned conversation that it's all right to like whatever music. <laughs> yeah. You like. yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, they certainly looked like they were having fun. There was lots yeah. of, there was lots of line dancing going up and down the street and people dressed in, you know, cowboy regalia. Wow. So Yeehaw, partner. Well, I suppose there's that there's that country and Irish thing, isn't it? Whatever that is, I don't really understand. Tell me this: why has why has that bridge not like we live in such a horrendous time where you know such awful music as Sabaton or Shinedown is really popular? 
why China. is there not like why is there not like country and western metal like i would have thought that, that would have been like a huge deal like you know but isn't that volbeat no well it's not it's like fucking it's like you're into some sort of bizarre folk music from some horrible place that's mixed with Lincoln Park. Like, so it's like uh, Lincoln Park, but with folk, you know. I don't know blah, 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 blah. No, I think, I think Volbeat is somewhere in there. Volbeat is somewhere between, it's got a bit of rockabilly, a bit of psychabilly, so therefore a tiny mm. bit of country and western. It's got some Danzig, and it's got Metallica, the Black Album, with huge overpowering vocals and choruses. Um, and I, I think them... Maybe I mean who else has in a smattering of country kid rock, um, Nickelback, yeah. a few, uh, you know. Like back, at, back in the day, would you say like were Nielsen kind of maybe it wasn't country country esque, but like they were so ballad heavy that it was about people you know just being nice all the time the way the country music can be. Look, like, you know. I don't know. Is that what country? I I don't know. I, I mean, mean, well, like, come on, like we're not talking about actual. We're not talking about you know good country music here. We're talking about like. The sort of country music they make in Northern Ireland, twangy, yeah. twee nonsense. But isn't that? But isn't but isn't that what Creed or something or Nickelback sort of occupies? That sort no, of. I, I, but I think that people people point. would say that's rock music. That's real rock, dude. Yeah. So you think there know. should be a big, a sort of something like cross between Declan Nurney and Metallica, maybe. Yeah, like, you know, Uncle Tom Angel Ripper, uh, did he not make, like, some Western-themed albums? That seems like a very German-style thing to do, or Lost Desperados, or I whatever. Know. He, you know, what he, had, he had one album that I liked, um, like, being, I, blah, 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 and I think they were just German schlag or beer-drinking songs, weren't they? Um, yeah. It skipped down, Beer auf Hawaii, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it's crazy, actually, isn't it, that like bands like him or like Sodom and Tankard could see that like in the mid to late nineties, it was actually be a better idea to go around singing beer drinking songs to people in pubs than it would be to play Sodom or Tankard music to people in pubs, like you know. Yeah, there was there was some sort of, but I think that was kind of with the backing of Vakan, wasn't it? Every year, Tom Angerup would be like the, the end band at Vakan or something. And he'd be playing these. Um... What, what was the what was the Tankard thing? Then? Like Tankard did, they weren't necessarily drinking songs. They were like German, like awful twee fucking shit seventy songs that were kind of like Eurovision entries or whatever. I don't know. There's I mean, a, I don't know the a name for the genre of music that maybe somebody will know in the comments section. Is it, but there's Schlager, right? Schlager is like beer drinking songs and stuff, isn't it? Isn't that what that's called? Yeah, but. Yeah, but is this not a different thing? Is this not like a fucking more like I get do 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 version oh, of this Black Lace. Stuff from Germany? Well, what's that? What's the two the two the the man and the woman who do they do um Black uh, Sabbath Paranoid cover and it's very solemn and she is sort of blonde. He is he's very weird and arresting looking, and it's called um oh fuck what are they called Bert Bert. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say like Robert Fripp and Toya Wilcox there, like it was like that sounds no, no, no. like that was a thing for a while. I need to know what this is. It's um, it's Bert on something other. Bert on. Yeah, Cindy on Bert, der Hund, der Baskerville. You know this. Der Hund, der Baskerville, as in about the hound of the yeah, Baskervilles. <laughs> And it's got a little dog in the video, and he's the hund de Baskerville, and they both stand there looking like this, and they look sort of like horror movie extras from a. I'm not know if that's a thing. That, so that, weird, isn't it? Like mu music like that that is not necessarily made for export. Like there was never an idea of trying to sell Uncle Tom records or Hank Ward records to people in switzerland or france who like tankard or sodom they were just like no this is not for you this is like you and sodom do songs only in german like and you're like okay well i don't need to know what this song's about well but, but how does that explain rammstein then i think rammstein is based on fireworks people like going to see the fireworks and fireworks <laughs> are cool and that's it so there's nothing else to explain <laughs> i don't I know, know some people love them and think that, like they're cool but I do actually like them. I don't love them, but I like them. But I will say that I went to see the show in Dublin 
maybe seven or eight years ago, and it was one of the most incredible shows I've ever seen. I mean, it was genuinely jaw dropping. Like me and my friend came out of it just like, what the fuck? I mean, it just literally, it did blow my mind. Now, yeah, I'm not a huge fucking class. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge fan, but I do have, I would say, five or six Rammstein albums that I've picked up for three, four, five quid a second hand over the years. I don't think I've ever bought one new, but um, I listened to the new one only about a month ago, about three or four times, and I quite enjoyed it. And you've got to give it to them the way they constantly reinvent their image. And the, the videos and the artistic conception of what they're doing mixed with the stage show that I don't think anybody has ever dared to do anything like that. It's fucking insane. So, I, I mean, you've got to kind of respect them for that. But obviously... Well, here, man, I'm, I'm, like, I, I do respect them. I don't like their music. I think their music is boring. And I think that's part of the reason why they're so focused on having an amazing show and an amazing concept is that, mm. I don't know, they're like don't, really fans that like... There's absolutely no way they sell as many records as they do concert, concert tickets. No. The idea is that you want to go and see it live and it's amazing live and it works in other like people love I don't know fucking like LCD sound system because their shows are brilliant like but people don't go out and buy their albums in the same droves that go to their concerts. I think it's the yeah. same thing with Spain or well, I, guess, like, yeah. I, I guess that's true. I mean I guess that was kind of also true with some metal bands from the 80s. Look at Priest were filling stadiums and big huge arenas but, you know, they weren't like top 10 album selling band in, in the USA or anything. Um, no. I think Rem- I'm sure with Motor- Motorhead as well. Like, there's no yeah. Motorhead album. Or maybe there's one or two, like, live at uh, Hammersmith that have sold over a million copies. But mm-hmm. generally, a lot of their records, you know, they weren't fucking million sellers. They were no. just one of those bands that encompassed the thing. People wanted to go and see them live and be part of that scene, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean Motorhead, I mean, you know, at their headlining best were probably if they toured the USA in the early 80s, couldn't have been doing more than 1,200 to 2,400 size places. But R- Rammstein is, um, yeah, it's a social or cultural anomaly, a band who can be that so idiosyncratically German, but yet it's managed to translate to this huge... Um, yeah, I think that's part of the of- problem with, with, with their music is that because it's so much of like what they are doing has been done by Dead Crops and bands like that in the 90s, that like... Apart from the spectacle and like the you know how cool their gigs are and their images and the concepts, it's like the music. It's not like you know when you're talking about Motorhead or when they did that tour. It was Motorhead, Merciful Fate, and Exciter. Look, like mm. that's some bill of bands that were totally changing music. You know, so I don't know. Again, this but it goes. It just goes down to personal taste for me because I don't get the music. It seems to me that the live show is the only draw. You know, that's why people yeah. would fucking. I mean, go, there's some, there's know? something about Ramstein which is this kind of, um, it, in a way, this sort of punishingly rhythmic, um, anti. I won't I won't call it anti-humanism, but it's like it's got a sort of anti-emotional stoic quality that I really quite admire. Like it's so not self-indulgent in in a in a weird way. Like it's got a lot of craft work and it's got a lot of this sort of strange um, Germanic sense of humor involved in it, but it's got something so um, slavishly devoted to this kind of stoic, rigid, rhythmic sense that I I can't help but admire the fact that you go and watch it and I don't know the lyrics, I don't understand them. And then when I do look at them in English and I go, okay, so they're still not indulging the audience's emotional whim. And there's something about it I quite like because it stands opposed to most bands who are that big who can fill a stadium that they aren't. Do you know what I mean? In that say, Rammstein fill a stadium in America with thousands of people who don't necessarily know what they're singing about, which I think is quite extraordinary considering that most yeah. bands who do that now, it's based on managing to emotionally manipulate you um, into, you know, I, I mean, maybe that's a broad sweeping statement, but there's something cold about Rammstein that I really admire. Like it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of at the heart of it is a kind of unfriendliness or, something cold and stoic maybe that's a misreading of the situation but the same but I, I admire that in craft work as well you know so maybe it appeals to i don't know something you know people, people who are lost in a forest that's that's the exact audience isn't it like yeah people who aren't singing about getting chocolate stains on their pants i guess i don't know there's something about it i like though you know um and live it really it does just it was fucking outrageous like 
I've never seen anything like it. Well, like fair play to them. Like it's, it, again, going back to the fucking stupid question of who are these people who are going to be headlining festivals? Like, I think it's great that like bands like Sabaton or like you know um, who are we talking about there? Uh, Volbeat. Who did Volbeat. The, uh, Volbeat. Like are doing big shows, you know, in places. But I don't think necessarily any of these bands could have went to Monsters of Rock, you know, or Sonosphere or Don- uh, Donington nowadays and like pull 60,000 people. There's no yeah. way that you know, my ball beat and, you know, Sabaton don't tour the UK ex- ex- extensively is because they'd have to play at 500 seat venues, you know, and they don't yeah, do that. I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, I think that if you take into account the sort of spring break culture of Hellfest back in some of these other festivals like this part of their appeal is that the part of their appeal is the um the spectacle the event the weekend the trip um and it's not necessarily about the band so i think i think that some festivals can be insulated as the older bands drop off because the festival culture itself is so huge and as long as there is someone there or thereabouts who's still got some gas left in the tank they can still go on for another 10 years and i agree with you i think um you know, like I, for example, Machine Head and Monomar at the moment are going around on a stadium tour, and I know I think it's the worst possible time to be on a tour is the energy crisis and post pandemic right now, and they're, you know, one third to half filling the arenas that they're in throughout the whole tour, and an awful lot of those bigger bands now are not finding out they're not insulated um, in the same way they thought. Yeah. Um, and those are the bands that are expected to be the headliners at festivals in the next couple of years. And at a, at a festival, I'm sure it's fine to hear Pursuit of Vikings, I guess. But um, yeah, and it's no fault of their own. I think it's part, mostly to do with the energy crisis. Touring itself is changing and that kind of thing. But um, you know what? That's something that, like we should talk about is the idea that like Anthrax had to cancel a European tour yeah. due to the call of petrol. Like that. That didn't happen in 1986. Whenever yeah. Anthrax toured, while fucking the uh, um, Russian nuclear power plant, like that, that whole thing happened in May 1986, and they went and did that tour anyway. Like you know, yeah. So it's so nuts to think that they were in those kind of times at a band like that. But you would imagine, you know, are getting a really, really sizable guarantee for saying we can't afford to get the gas to get get from you know Bilbao to fucking Madrid. Um, I, I'd say that that's half. The truth. I'd say what's more like the truth is that the ticket sales were appalling, or the ticket sales were. The, the, the I, guard- I think that uh, I think that um, municipal waste and anthrax would have been probably a sellout in a lot of places. There have been like the Bataclan, or like if they're able to sell out like the Colston Hall in Bristol or Bristol Academy or wherever they're playing, well, that's like thousand five hundred people. I would imagine that that's the draw generally. Like you know. Yeah, but I just don't know. I mean, it really depends. I mean, it's um. There's a lot of, I know there's a lot of other tours that have been supposed to be going around Europe that have been cancelled as well for poor ticket sales. Depends how much the tickets were. Um, I mean, okay, like you're talking 1,200, 1,500, 1,400 um, venues. Uh, maybe, maybe, I mean, I've heard the tickets are slow also on the Behemoth Carcass tour, which is Behemoth Carcass Arch Enemy. Um, but then again, I've heard that the tickets are slow. I'd like to go just to be on to others, but you know, but nah. and do that. Yeah. They're um, okay. They're okay. I mean, I think Dokken did what they did far better thirty-five years ago, but you know, it's it's not bad. Well, come on, it's not. They're not like they're not like Dokken good, but like I know, like I think that the thing I like about them is there's a bit of like that kind of nineties Paradise Lost vibe about them. Yeah. That, you know, Oddly enough, I said that. Kind of cool, like, you know. Black Oddly album enough, in goth, like, you know. Oddly enough, I said that to the guy. Um, I, you know, for, we had a few dealings, um, and he said, "I don't know. I've never heard that." I said, "You've never heard Icon, or, um, you know that that because I could hear that in their sound, you know." And mm. I think they're an okay band. I just, I guess, what it is is that when you talk to people who like them who don't know the reference points, and you're like, if you just listened to lightning strikes again you might be like oh i get what these vocal harmonies should be or whatever you know but maybe that's just me being a i think i think if people are real bollocks i don't know how we always end up back to talking about docking like but i think <laughs> if people heard lightning strikes again as the first song you ever heard by docking you'd be like okay i'm gonna listen to their albums there's people probably heard like kind of shit docking songs like into the fire first and they're like 
this is just like you know of the time Hollywood music. I like Enter the Fire, but I know what you mean. Mm. No, I'm being, I'm being a bit, I'm being a bit harsh. I'm being a bit harsh. And no, they're they're good enough. Like it's fine. Um, Since we got on to the her, her metal, I was in San Francisco and went oh, yeah. to the stadium heavy metal gig. Look and saw yeah. all the excesses of the new world. Go on, tell tell me about this. Oh, um, tell me about what this was like. So, um, yeah, you feel well, well, like you, a Hang on, hang on. First, you saw Motley Crue, Def Leppard, and Poison, and Joan Jett. Okay, so okay, give me your what's your your. You're not going to like this. Joan Jett was really good. She was like class. She's like a whole bunch of songs that were hits in America that I didn't really realize. But like, are they all? I don't know. Have you ever been to? Have you ever been to a sporting event in America? Like you know, gone to like a yeah whatever game. So it's like that, like so, like everyone is hanging around eating. Like so, you're standing around uh, or like sitting in like the Dodgers fucking stadium or whatever the Giants, and like everyone's eating like chicken and shit like that. And there's guys throwing beers. You know, the guy in the yellow t-shirt is firing beers up. Beers were twenty bucks. So that's Oof. that's what's going on in these days. Twenty bucks. Wow. Yeah. But like, yeah, Jung Jet was really class. She fucking she totally nailed it, and Poison were really fast. Like you could yeah. totally tell that Poison were like, you know, there's a whole bunch of people here who kind of know us, and their set was legitimately full of great, great tunes. Like there was yeah. like at least seven or eight songs that I was like, oh man, these are like singles that I recognize. So yeah, I I watched um, them and they looked like they had energy, and he looked like he still had his voice. You know, he was great. Like him and Joan Jet, like were definitely in the place where they're like, okay. We're capable of blowing away an arena of like seventy thousand people or whatever. Yeah, because um, I mean, when you think about like, it, like like Poison were kind of like rudimentary back in the day, and so they've only kind of got better. Whereas the other two, totally. well, anyway, sorry, I interrupted your your review. Go on. Oh yeah, but like I suppose that's that is the point, isn't it? It's just like Joan Jet and Poison are both bands that like have generally would be playing like you know either big clubs or like halls and stuff like that. So they're not usually playing those kind of gigs and they made the most of it. They had a great, great, great fucking turnout and it was class. But like, it was expensive as well. Like we were sitting in the gods and it was 125 bucks. And if you want to sit like, you know, wow. on the on the ground, it was like 700 bucks. So 700 bucks? They, yeah. Like, so they, they know exactly. They're like, dude, anyone who is considering going to see Def Leppard and Motley Crue, is uh, you know wealthy enough to pay big money so for this? Like, so and you, it was full of families. Like people were bringing all their kids and all that sort of stuff. Like you and, mean, like in the bit that's right in front of the stage. That was seven. So like, it, so like imagine imagine you were at the RDS, which is just like a typical fucking big field venue, and there was chairs all over the floor. So there was yeah. no standing on the floor at all. So there's chairs all over the floor, and all those all those seats were like seven hundred bucks, and they Fuck. were full. Boom. Quids. And, then, and so what was who played last? <clears throat> Def Leppard headlined. And like rightfully so, because I think like Motley Crue, as much as they were kind of cool and stuff like that, like it was kind of more based on they had like like really hot strippers hanging about and singing back and vocals. So like I guess that made it more of a kind of show. But man, this is insane. They didn't show Mick Mars face or body on the Jumbotron at all. So they showed his hands whenever he's playing guitar solos or occasionally you would see his back walking around. But they obviously were under strict orders. You're not allowed to show Mick Mars' shoulders, head, hat, any of that shit, like, you know. Wow. Wow. I, I mean, <clears throat> I, I, it's obviously he just he just obviously looks so fucking <clears throat> so much like death that you're not you're not allowed to. Wow. Oh, yeah. If you saw a close up of your face, you would be like. You know, this is the exorcist here. Fucking so, hell. like, they weren't great. And, like, they did play pretty much. They played every song you would want to hear, like, apart from some of the stuff from the first album. Um, But, yeah, they didn't sound great. Like, you know. No. And, like, Def Leppard, I don't know if, if you've seen them before, yeah. but they kind of just, it's a very synthesized and slick kind of sound. So they sounded really, really fast. And they really, really brought it. Like, their set was really, really cool. They sounded... Hundred percent vocally, musically, and stuff, but it's it was still just, you know, 
it was very far removed from heavy rock, like, you know? Yeah, I mean, I saw them headline Sweden Rock um, one year, maybe 10 years ago, and it struck me that they, when they, they, they looked like Dimmu Borger when they came on. They were all kind of dressed in black with long jackets, and it was all very serious. Like, they were very, we're a serious band. And uh, oddly enough, Poison were also playing that year, um, and Poison were, like, again, just a fucking party band, good time. And Poison sort of stole the show on the other stage from under their noses, you know? <laughs> Def Leppard was a bit po-faced and a bit, um, you know, we'd like to think we're serious artists and then play pour some sugar on me, which is okay. Don't get me wrong, I, I really love Def Leppard, but I don't know. <clears throat> I've certainly seen them enough times. Like, if I died and never saw them again, I would be very happy with that. Like, so, yeah. and like, you know, my missus is a huge Mot Motley Crue fan, so look, like, I was totally, like, totally over the moon that she had such a great time, but, like, she was also not blinded enough to be, like, here, this this was great. It and was, how was it his singing? Good. How was Vince's singing? It, so, it was okay. So, like, it's nothing to do with pitch. Like, he's not one of these guys like Don Dawkins where the issue is that he can't pitch the notes or he can't hold notes or anything like that. Yeah. It's that, like, you know... It, he kind of wrote a load of tunes in the 80s where there was lots of fast singing and yeah. like now he doesn't want to do it so instead of like you know having to be like meh, 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 like yeah. he'll just be like meh, meh, meh. like he he's missing out quite a lot of the words but he's not danzigging it and being all like here the crowd you yeah. sing this line for me you know so yeah i mean with the stuff i watched on video it was like oh he's okay I mean, it doesn't help him that he's about like, four or five stone overweight. I thought it was only one of these things where it was cool. Um, sorry, go on ahead. Oh, no, I just, it doesn't help him finding the energy when he's really, you know, quite heavily overweight. But he didn't seem to be struggling that bad. No, like I, I, I was expecting it to be like a total car crash. And whenever I heard that like Motley Crue were headlining some of the shows, I was like, Fucking hell! Like, I obviously it's going well enough for that to happen. Like, you know, because as, as much as we're ragging on never want to see Death Leopard again, they're always as good as they were the first time. Like, yeah. they're never unbelievable, but yeah. they're never shit. Like, they're always just like, here's all the Death Leopard tunes. It's kind of like going to see Brian Adams. You're like, here's the songs in the right key, and it sounds great. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, seven hundred fucking dollars though. Wow. 